We have another question. Does God know the future? You know, there are questions out there that we sometimes just take for granted. Uh, those of us who have been around the Bible all of our lives, uh, we, just, we just assume that everyone knows the answer to this question. Uh, then again, there's no doubt people in the world who still been around the Bible all their life, but they've been taught differently on this question. But for the most part, most people believe the answer to that, of course, is an astounding yes, of course, overwhelming yes. Of course, God knows the future. The Bible makes it clear that God is omniscient. He knows everything. And that in and of itself kind of gives us an idea that obviously he must know the future because you wouldn't be omniscient if you didn't know everything. And the future is part of everything. All right. But let's not go quite that simply. Let's consider a few things that we can see from God's word about God knowing the future. Um, the Bible has prophecies in it. Now, the word, the word for prophecy uh, literally speaks of just speaking for another person, or prophet, I guess I should say, is one who speaks for another person. He delivers a prophecy, but he's delivering something for someone else. And that's why we have prophets in the Bible. Uh, they deliver God's word. First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, the last two verses make it clear that no prophet speaks of his own interpretation, but he delivers, he delivers things that are given to him by the Holy Spirit. All right. And so prophecy can speak of merely um, telling something God wanted told. For instance, uh, the book of Matthew talks about the life of Jesus Christ. It's not prophesying something for the future, for the most part. It's, prophet, prophesy, it's telling something about what's our past. And for that matter, when Matthew wrote it, was his past. He wrote it many years after it occurred, uh, Jesus' life. It certainly was after the cross, a couple of decades after the cross, when Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. All right? so, but it's prophecy. Not because it has future stuff in it, but because it's, it's talking about um, it's, it's delivering a message that's from someone else in this particular thing, delivering a message from God, prophecy. Now, normally when we use the word prophecy, we do mean future telling. In our, in our society, we say, well, that's a prophecy. We are meaning it's something talking about the future. Well, all through the Bible, we have things talking about the future, the future of when it was written down, all right? As I, again, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Matthew wrote his book uh, a few decades after Jesus Christ died on the cross. And it's about the life of Jesus Christ. But throughout the book of Matthew, Matthew shows that Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And this is when the wise men came to Herod and wanted to know where the Christ was going to be born. And in Matthew chapter 2, Herod then goes to the, chief, to the priests, the chief priests, to find out where he was going to be born. In verse 4 of Matthew chapter 2, after Herod had been asked by the wise men, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. It goes on to quote from Micah in verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now that was written centuries before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. And he was the Christ, he was the Messiah. Micah wrote it down. He was a prophet writing for God. He was writing about the future in this particular case. He was telling something that wasn't going to happen for centuries. How did he know that? Well, the Holy Spirit inspired him. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is God. God inspired Micah to write those words. So God knew the future. There are many prophecies of Jesus Christ given throughout the Old Testament. And for those prophecies to be to fulfill, be fulfilled in one man, 
all of them about one man centuries before that one man was even born is, is an incredible thing. It's the, the probabilities of that occurring, uh, it, it would be like winning the lottery, but except winning the lottery would be easier. You know, they oftentimes say your chances of winning the lottery are less than your chances of being struck by lightning. Well, your chances of one man fulfilling all the prophecies that, that Jesus Christ fulfilled, all the prophecies of Jesus, that one man would fulfill them, is less than winning the lottery. Okay? The, in fact, the lottery would be a whole lot easier. I one time heard it described like this. And by the way, this, this was done by people whose job it was, was to figure out probabilities. And they described it like this. For all the prophecies of Jesus Christ to come to pass in one man, for one man to fulfill all those prophecies, it would be like the probability of having the entire state of Texas covered in coins. Let's say it's covered in quarters. And... For one man to be told, go in there, into the state, from whatever direction you want to go in, walk however far you want to walk, bend down and pick out one quarter. And there's all those quarters, and only one of them was from 1942. And, okay, let's say that. Well, that man was to go pick that quarter out. The probability of him to walk into Texas, however far he wanted to do, reach down and pick up one of those quarters that are layering the entire state that large of a mass of area and to pick up the right quarter that he was supposed to. That's the probability of one man fulfilling the prophecies given about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That is what those, that is what those statistics individuals figured out what the possibility was. Well, that, that, that's several things. We know the book of Isaiah was written before Jesus Christ was born. And yet in the book of Isaiah, you have things that are mentioned about what was going to happen to Jesus Christ in his death, including the way he was going to die. Go to Isaiah 53, and let's look at that. Isaiah 53. And this is quickly becoming a uh, video about prophecy, but this is still making the point, does God know the future? Well, God knowing the future is very much involved in his prophecy of what was going to happen in the life of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, start down in verse, in verse 5. Mm -hmm. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Now here it is, a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And it's not only saying that he died, you know, his, it's going on to say he died. Right now it just says he was pierced. But this is going to talk about his death and we'll see that. But not only that he died for our sins, our transgressions, but that he was pierced. Well, the nails in, in, his, in his hands and in his feet. The, the, the spear thrust up through his side. Okay? Um, so those prophecies about Jesus Christ, that's just one right there. How he was going to die. Keep on going. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Now, once again, before Pilate had Jesus sent to the cross, he scourged him. So here we have another prophecy about Jesus Christ. And again, it was because of our sins that all these things occurred to him. He was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. I'm sorry, he was oppressed, and, and he was afflicted. And he, yet he did not open his mouth. That's verse 7. Again, that's exactly how Jesus Christ was before Pilate. Pilate even asked him, aren't you going to say anything? You know, I have the ability to have you put to death. Aren't you going to say anything? And Jesus, Jesus was not going to reply. The same way he was before, when he was before the Sanhedrin. Again, prophecy about Jesus Christ. You can go on um, down to verse 9. Oh, well, no, I'm sorry. I skipped, skipped the rest of verse 7. Uh, like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Okay. He, he, of course, was the lamb, lamb for our sins. Uh, drop down to verse 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet he, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It was a rich man who gave up his tomb for Jesus Christ. Okay, Drop on down to, verse, to the very end, verse 12. 
Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will be and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Once again, Jesus Christ was crucified between two thieves and considered, uh, uh, you know, a uh, a breaker of the law with those two thieves, um, and. He, he, Yet he himself bore the sin of many. He interceded for the transgressors. Again, just exactly what he did from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus Christ died on the cross. In, in that writing, the incredible amount, just in verse, chapter 53 of the things that Jesus Christ fulfilled, would have been impossible for anyone to predict. So again, how did Isaiah know that? Well, God told him. Now this is hard for us. This is hard for us to think about how someone could know the future. Some people believe, in fact, I had a man say this to me not too long ago, that if God knew the future, we wouldn't have any choice because he knows what we're gonna do. Now think about that for a few seconds. That actually can sound to seem a little bit logical. If you know what I'm gonna do, then that takes away my choice. Uh, but no, it doesn't. Um, God knows the future like I know the past or like you know the past. For instance, the 16th president of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. Did I make Abraham Lincoln become the 16th president because I know that he did that, that he decided to run for office? No, I did not make him become president. I know that he made that choice to become president and he won the election. That's nothing astounding. That's the past, okay? We would not sit there and say, ooh, ah, you know, how did Albert know that? Well, no, that doesn't make, that's, of course Albert knows that. That's the past. Well, that's how God is. God is outside of time. Time does not affect him. Peter describes that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. When, when Peter says to God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't understand time. He knows what a day is. He knows what a thousand years is. But a day and a thousand years mean the same to him in that it doesn't affect him. He's outside of time. Okay. Time is told by the rising of the sun and the, and the going down of the sun, by the constellations going through the going passing before us in the sky. We tell our seasons, okay? We know time. A year is how long it takes the, the earth to rotate around the sun. That's how we tell time. Well, God's outside of all that. He's not, you know, he's, he's everywhere and he's in heaven and all of this time stuff doesn't affect him. He is eternal. One of the ways I like to describe that is it's like looking at this picture here on the wall. I am outside the picture. I can see it all. It is something that I'm able to look at and obviously the artist had you know, put those windows in and he uses the Bible for a roof. It's describing the spiritual house, the church in this particular picture. But looking at it, I can see the bricks, I can see all the steps, I can see the door. Now, we, in, if we consider this picture like time, we live in a spot in the picture. We're here in the picture. We know everything that's before. We don't know anything that's after. But we are in this spot in the picture. Right? But God is outside the picture. He sees it all. That old idiom that we oftentimes use. You're not seeing the full picture. No, as far as time is concerned, we're not seeing the full picture. All we know is the, is the past. But God sees the full picture. He knows exactly what's happening. And for us, if we were right here in the picture, this spot, it would astound us, anyone, to be able to know this part of the picture. But God, who's able to see the whole thing, can tell us the rest of the story, if he wants to. And he did that in several places within the Bible. The book of Revelation even shows the judgment scene of Christ on the throne. Well, who, who told us that? God did. He tells us exactly what's going to happen. There is, there is no taking away the choice. God, 
allows us to make our own choices. People are going to make a choice about Judgment Day. Whether they mean to or not, they're going to make a choice. But God's not making them decide one way or the other. They decide on their own. And God knows who is going to decide what.